Hey, I'm Rob Witcher, and I'm here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to vulnerabilities in Domain 3 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the fourth of nine videos for Domain 3. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Vulnerabilities inevitably arise when building and operating complex systems. It's easy to have a vulnerability in a single line of code, let alone hundreds, thousands, or even millions of lines of code and numerous interconnected systems. As security professionals, it is important for us to understand where vulnerabilities typically occur and how to design and develop systems to prevent these vulnerabilities. We must ensure that the people involved in the design development, deployment, and operational processes have the right knowledge and training. Accordingly, we're going to walk through a series of common vulnerabilities and systems and how to prevent them, starting with single points of failure, which are non-redundant parts of a larger system. And if one of these single points of failure fails, then the entire system stops working. A good example would be having a single router or a single firewall, which all traffic must pass through to and fro from the internet. A single firewall or router failing would result in all access to the internet being lost, thus a single point of failure. How do we present such single points of failure? Redundancy. We don't just have one firewall, we have at least two. And they're configured and interconnected in such a way that the failure of one does not result in the entire network losing connection to the internet. We can also have redundancy in software, services, providers, and even people. The next vulnerability, bypass controls, are methods intentionally built into a system which allow security controls to be bypassed or circumvented. A good example is the configuration reset button on the back of a network device. You use a paper clip or a pencil to hold down the button for five or 10 seconds, then the device is reset to factory default and the current administrative password is forgotten. Bypass controls are intentional. They are created for a good reason but they certainly introduce risk by allowing security controls to be circumvented. To deal with the risk introduced by bypass controls, we need to ensure additional mitigating controls are implemented to reduce the risk to an acceptable level. In the example of the reset button on a network device, the way we reduce the risk of an unauthorized person wielding a bent paper clip to pwn the network is to have physical security controls. Ensure that only authorized individuals can get near the network device and thus reduce the risk of unauthorized usage of the bypass control. The mediating controls can be all sorts of things, physical security, enhanced logging and monitoring, segregation of duties, and all sorts of other things. It all depends on the nature of the bypass control. Talk tau, time of check, time of use, also known as race conditions, is a type of vulnerability where an application checks the state of a resource before using that resource, but the resource's state can be changed between the check and the use in a way that invalidates the results of the check. This can cause the application to perform invalid actions. In other words, or to simplify this, an attacker attempts to race in and change a resource, a file, a variable, or some data in memory between when the resource is checked and used. There are numerous rather technical ways to reduce TalkTow vulnerabilities. Exception handling, transaction which provide concurrency controls, file locks, etc. But the answer you should look for on the exam is rather simple. Increase the frequency of how often a check is performed to ensure access is appropriate, thus reducing the window of time in which an attacker can race in and do something they aren't supposed to. Emanations are any sort of radio waves, electrical signals, light, sounds, vibrations, that radiate from a system and can be intercepted to eavesdrop on the system and thus allow the leakage of information. Emanations are vulnerabilities that need to be addressed and there are three methods to do so. Shielding is various methods used to block the emanations from a system so they cannot be detected. You can block electromagnetic fields with Faraday cages, sound with insulation, light with opaque walls. A type of shielding developed by the military is known as Tempest and it is specifically designed to shield devices that emit electromagnetic radiation. So just remember, Tempest is a method of shielding. The next method that can be used to reduce the risk of emanations is white noise. White noise is blasting out strong random signals and thus drowning out the weak emanations from a secure device in the sea of white noise. 
And finally, control zones, which means placing high value systems in a physically secured zone. Essentially, put in place physical security controls to ensure only authorized individuals can get near high value systems and thus prevent an attacker from getting close enough to detect the emanations from these systems. The next vulnerability is covert channels, which are unintentional communication paths that can unintentionally disclose confidential information. There are two major types of covert channels, storage and timing, and storage is by far the most common. Covert channel vulnerabilities can be addressed by careful analysis of systems and processes to identify these unintentional communication paths and design controls to prevent or mitigate them. The predictive power of pizza deliveries is a great example of a covert channel. Add a comment below if you get that reference. Aggregation and inference are vulnerabilities that occur whenever you aggregate, collect, and centralize a lot of data in one location. Think data warehouses or big data, data lakes. The major vulnerability here is unauthorized inference. Someone may be able to infer, to figure out something that they are not supposed to. To reduce the risk of unauthorized inference, you can implement the concept of polyinstantiation, which means that different versions of the same information or process can exist at different classification levels. In other words, our would-be attacker can only see their version of a process or a row in the database. Other versions can exist containing different information, but they are invisible, thus preventing unauthorized inference. Mobile devices are considered a significant vulnerability due to the fact that they often contain significant amounts of sensitive information, and they are mobile. They get forgotten on all sorts of different seats, taxi, train, airplane, and latrine. And a misplaced or stolen mobile device has been the source of many a privacy breach. An excellent way of reducing the risk of wayward mobile devices is to have clearly defined policies regarding the acceptable use of mobile devices, and specifically requiring that sensitive data not be stored on mobile devices or severely limited, and having training and procedures in place to ensure that acceptable use policy is followed by employees. Mobile devices are inherently taken away from the office and used in remote locations. Connections from the mobile device back to the corporate network should be encrypted to ensure the protection of sensitive data in transit. And the security of the mobile device itself, the endpoint, as it were, should be considered. Controls such as strong authentication, whole drive encryption, and remote wipe can be used. The Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP, have developed a top 10 list of the most common security flaws and vulnerabilities in mobile devices. As security professionals, we must ensure that the following common vulnerabilities are addressed in system design, development, and operation. Improper platform usage means the security functionalities built into the mobile device, things like Touch ID, Face ID, and Keychain, are not used or used incorrectly. To prevent this vulnerability, secure coding and configuration management should be used. In other words, use these good security features. Insecure data storage means that sensitive data, such as PII, is stored in insecure directories on the mobile device. Data in such directories can be trivially accessed if an attacker gets physical access to a device. That's a nice way of saying they steal it. Or the attacker writes malware, which can copy the data out of the insecure directory and send it back to the attacker. The best way to avoid this? Don't store sensitive data on a mobile device. Insecure communications refers to the fact that most mobile devices will communicate with a server across the super sketchy internet. Any such data in transit could potentially be intercepted and read by an attacker. To secure data in transit, encrypt it using protocols like TLS and authenticate the server with certificates. Insecure authentication refers to an attacker figuring out how a mobile application calls the backend server it's connected to. And once the attacker figures this out, they bypass the app and send requests directly to the server, bypassing the authentication mechanisms built into the mobile app. To prevent this vulnerability, perform authentication on the server side. Insufficient cryptography means a mobile device is using crappy encryption algorithms and or algorithms that were poorly implemented. The rather obvious way to avoid this is to use good algorithms that will withstand the test of time and implement them properly. Authorization is where a system determines what functionality a user will be allowed to access. The insecure authorization vulnerability, therefore, refers to doing a poor job of this authorization step 
potentially allowing an attacker to bypass the authorization and or grant themselves access they are not entitled to. To prevent this vulnerability, authorization should be performed by the backend server and not the mobile device. And the server should verify that any requests from a mobile device are permittable based on what the user is authorized to access. Client code quality refers to software running on a mobile device that is vulnerable to common attacks like memory leaks and buffer overflows. These weaknesses in mobile software are exploitable using malware or phishing. To prevent, write more secure code. Developers must be knowledgeable and trained to use secure coding practices and write secure code, which is a lot less common than you would hope. Code tampering refers to an attacker changing or adding new malicious code into a mobile application, allowing them to do fraudulent things like steal identities. To prevent, mobile applications must be able to detect if their code has been tampered with at runtime. Reverse engineering refers to an attacker carefully analyzing a mobile app's code to reveal information about backend servers is connected to, reveal problems or weaknesses with crypto, steal intellectual property, etc. To prevent, use code obfuscation tools. I talk about the different types of code obfuscation in the first video of Domain 8, which I've linked to. And the final OWASP top 10 mobile vulnerability, extraneous functionality which refers to an attacker carefully analyzing an application to find hidden functionality left behind by a developer. This hidden functionality will often allow the attacker to figure out how to gain unauthorized access to backend servers. To prevent, make sure extraneous functionality is removed before an app is published by doing things like manual code review. All right, now let's talk about web-based vulnerabilities. A huge and growing percentage of applications are now web-based, and thus the common vulnerabilities in web-based applications, in web-based systems, is an important topic on the CISSP exam. We will start with cross-site scripting. These are attacks in which malicious scripts are injected into otherwise benign and trusted websites, and a visitor's browser will download and execute the attacker's script essentially allowing an attacker to run code on victims' machines, which allows the attacker to do things like exfiltrate data. There are three major flavors of cross-site scripting. We'll start with stored cross-site scripting. An attacker discovers a vulnerable website and injects their code into the web application in such a way that the code is stored on the server and then displayed to every subsequent user that visits the web page. This can be achieved by the attacker simply entering a comment on a website that has some sort of forum or comment section. And rather than the attacker adding some pithy comment about how someone else's opinion on the internet is wrong, they enter JavaScript code into the comment field and hit submit. The attacker's comment, the code, is stored on the server. And every subsequent user's browser is going to download the HTML page with the JavaScript code embedded in it, parse the page, and execute the malicious JavaScript code. Stored cross-site scripting is persistent. Every subsequent user will download and execute the injected code once the attack has occurred. Reflected cross-site scripting works a little differently. The malicious code from an attacker is only reflected back to one specific user. Here's how this can work. An attacker sends the victim an email, perhaps as a phishing attack. And contained within that email is a link, a URL, Universal Resource Locator. And the URL contains some malicious JavaScript code. The user clicks on the URL, sending the request to the server. The server then displays a web page to the user that contains the malicious code from the URL, effectively reflecting the malicious code back to the user. And the user's browser dutifully executes the malicious code. That's a rather wildly oversimplified explanation. Let me know in the comments if you want me to create a deep dive video on reflected or stored cross-site scripting. You should remember that reflected cross-site scripting is the most common form of cross-site scripting. DOM, which stands for Document Object Model, is a much more technically complicated way of achieving cross-site scripting, and it's very rare. Accordingly, I wouldn't worry about it for the exam. The final piece that is important to think about for cross-site scripting is ultimately who is the target of attack. And the answer is the client. The user's browser is what the attacker is targeting in cross-site scripting attacks. Okay, next common web-based vulnerability, cross-site request forgery. 
This is where an attacker forces or tricks a user into executing unwanted actions on a web application in which the user is currently authenticated, effectively allowing an attacker to execute authorized commands on a server. Again, that's a rather wildly oversimplified explanation. Who is the target of attack in cross-site request forgery? The attack passes through the user and may negatively impact the user, but ultimately the target of attack is the server. Remember that. SQL injection. SQL, structured query language, is the language used to communicate with databases. A web application can send SQL commands to a backend database to verify if a user's username and password are valid, to store new data in the database, or to retrieve data from the database. The database is where the web application stores a lot of its data, and a user should not be able to directly command and control this backend database. In SQL injection attacks, this is exactly what is happening. An attacker sends some SQL code to the web server, and then the web server passes the SQL code on to the database, allowing the attacker to control the database. Not good. Here's an example of how SQL injection can be achieved. An attacker could enter text into a form field, such as a username and a password, and submit the text to the web server. The web server then sends the supplied username and password to the database as part of a SQL command. And if the web server hasn't validated the provided text, then it could be allowing SQL injection attacks to occur. How then do we prevent SQL injection attacks? Input validation. The web application should never allow SQL code from a user to be passed directly to the database. The web server must validate all input, sanitize the input by removing special characters or escaping them. Here's a big hint for the exam. You will likely see very technical questions on SQL injection or cross-site scripting and equally technical answers to choose from. But if you boil them down, the answer you are almost always looking for is that the user's input must be validated in some way, sanitized. This is how we prevent these attacks. And that is an overview of vulnerabilities within Domain 3, covering the most critical concepts to know for the exam. If you found this video helpful, you can hit the thumbs up button, and if you want to be notified when we release additional videos in this mind map series, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications. I'll provide links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Thanks very much for watching, and all the best in your studies.